Hello and welcome to Baiju Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive analysis, today we'll be discussing five important articles out of the Hindu newspaper. Before we begin, as always, we are available on Telegram, so you can download the app via the QR code given here or the link given in the description below. Further, we have some announcements for you. We have offline workshops. So we have one in Bangalore, thereafter in Pune, in Kolkata, and in Jaipur. And as always, we have a mock test which will be followed by the workshop. So if you are in any of these cities, you should come, give the mock test and interact with our faculty. The last announcement is that we have a very interesting session by Harshmeet sir. The explained session 8 p.m. today, which will be discussing Rishi Sunak as the Prime Minister. What are the implications of that? In itself, a very important and landmark appointment. And this is at 8 p.m. on YouTube. So do like and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any of our videos. With this, let's enter the first article, which is coming from Turkey. And a very important but dangerous precedence which has been created in Turkey related to disinformation law recently passed on October 14th. Now, when we talk about the disinformation law, before we go into the nitty gritty of the article itself, this is a tool which is now being used by Erdogan's government as a form of controlling dissent and stifle press freedom and generally freedom of speech in Turkey. Turkey in itself is in a major economic crisis. People argue that there is as of right now inflation at 186% whilst the government would argue at 86% and the disinformation law is being used as a tool to stifle press freedom within the country itself. So the Turkish parliament has adopted a much critiqued disinformation law and this word itself is very very interesting which is disinformation not misinformation neither fake news disinformation that accords jail term for up to three years to social media users and journalists for spreading disinformation now the concern is that this is going to be used to curtail social media and journalistic freedom in the country and turkey's law can be a precedence for the whole world itself because the parliamentary approval to such a law means that the parliament itself, democracy itself is trying to stifle freedom of speech. So what are the basic contours and what are the basic points or nitty gritties which you need to remember for the examination? First, cumulatively known as a disinformation law, it comprises of 40 articles that would amend about 23 different laws in Turkey itself. Out of these 40 articles, what matters to us the most is article 29 because it is related to a very sensitive matter. It says it designates it an offense to publicly disseminate misleading information about countries internal and external security, public order, general well-being for the purpose of causing fear or panic amongst the populace. Now the point is there is no definition given to publicly misleading internal external and the purpose of causing fear and panic. So the problem is it's a very vague statement. The article itself has no real basis in which we need to understand it. It's just a random statement which has been given. So that is the bigger issue here. And the article introduces a jail term between one to three years for any violation with the extension of an additional half of the initially stipulated term if the actions are done in anonymity. So they don't want anonymity aspect. If that is there, they will increase the jail term. Journalists can now go for jail terms for basic dissent and basic critique of the government itself. And the social media platforms could now be asked to hand over data to the Turkish courts if needed as a form of evidence. So before we go to the aspect related to the logic and what the Turkish government is arguing, in itself this article is very dangerous because as I said, it creates a precedence in the world because now countries can follow this model saying that misleading information can be used as jail terms. And more than that, the purpose of causing fear or panic. This is a very vague statement. This has no real basis with regards to specificities. Therefore, we need to make sure that these type of laws have very specific provision. Now, what has the Turkish government argued? The Turkish government is arguing that the law would combat cases where the internet is used to share illegal content under false names and where anonymous accounts slander and defame individuals of different political thought, religion and ethnicity. So the government is arguing that we don't want anonymous people harassing people all across the world and even in the country itself. And therefore, political thought, religion and ethnicity should be protected 
from illegal content and false names and anonymous accounts using them to defame now this in itself looks benevolent in itself looks benevolent how in the larger agenda this can again be interpreted the vaguest way possible which is that what is illegal content what is defaming who is an individual and how dissent and critique is different from basically any other matter which is as of right now in the public discourse because for one person that could be praise the other person it could technically mean defaming so these are very vague terms and we need to figure out what they actually mean in that regard critics including the venice commission which is a very important advisory body within the council of europe on constitutional matters has argued that unclear interpretation of certain terminologies especially disinformation is a problematic aspect of this law and as i said the problem is there is no definition of anything for you that is disinformation for me that is information who believes and who does not believe it also matters so the law would now recognize news websites as part of mainstream media and they would thus have to comply with the same regulations as for newspapers so there could be aspect of censorship involved this includes taking down reports when flagged by regulatory authorities and publishing a refutation on the same hyperlink so for example there was a mistake in any of the news is as of right now in online news you don't need to do it in turkey but now they would have to put in a refutation that it was a mistake on the same link itself the point is that this is technically trying to stifle larger online freedom and press freedom in turkey itself and turkey has been known to have an unimpressive record when it comes to press freedom itself because it ranks 149 out of 180 in press freedom index it more than that as per a report of the journalists union of turkey 270 journalists have already been put on trial last year while 57 were physically assaulted and 54 news websites and 1355 articles were blocked because they were talking about the government and and its policies in that regard now the point again is very simple and why are we doing this topic because this is a very major moment in world history because at the end of the day now there's a country which is making a law for disinformation and putting journalist and people be it anonymous be it not anonymous in jail for anything which they've written down and basically how do you define disinformation how do you define fake news how do you define what we call as defaming these are very vague terms so the council of europe itself is very very concerned about this matter that is creates constitutional precedents in the world over and above that now news sites which were trying to tell us the real picture of what was happening in turkey come under the same rules and regulation as newspapers so in a way turkey and erdogan's government in that sense has been known to stifle press freedom and a lot of fishy activities are happening within turkey as of right now and with this there is a new type of control which the government is pushing over the press and this is something which we need to look out for democracy and freedom of press and freedom of speech go together and dissent is a very important part of democracy in that regard so this topic very important for your polity discussions and generally international relations and press freedom in that regard let us see do other countries also follow suit in that sense as of right now the government in turkey has done more to damage the freedom of speech in turkey itself therefore we need to be cautious about these types of legislation now let's move to the second important topic which is related to a new thing which has been proposed by and will be implemented by 2024 in india which is a uniform law and order policy in the context of terrorism in the context of recent blasts over and above that with the changing form of terrorism insurgency and the internal security of india being threatened by different players what the home minister has pointed out is that there's a need to centralize the authorities and the information when it comes to national security and terrorism into one authority which also has state based branches therefore the home minister on thursday has argued that states should have a uniform law and order policy as of right now you would know that law and order falls under state list polices go under the state list itself however he is saying that there is a need for centralization when it comes to collaborative efforts and more centralization so what he is arguing is that when it comes to certain crimes 
such as cross border terrorism and cyber crimes there is need to transcend the regional and international boundaries therefore there is need for a uniform law and order because the nature of terrorism and cyber attacks is changing therefore we need a better and more centralized system in that regard so to counter terrorist activities each state would have a national investigation agency an nia office as the agency had been given extra territorial jurisdiction and additional powers to confiscate property in terror related cases so as a proposed concept what the government of india is going to do that each state is going to have an nia office and it will also be given the extra territorial jurisdiction and the power to confiscate property related to terrorism now this is equally concerning and encouraging because it is encouraging because there is a need for a centralization of information when it comes to terror however this also creates the precedence for misuse of this law and the misuse of this authority by political actors which is the downside to the story however still as of right now with the nature of cyber attacks with the nature of terrorism the way things are working out in the national security sphere of india there is a need for centralization for sure further what the home minister is arguing is that centralization of data on terror and other crimes is very very important because there needs to be a principle which needs to be applied one data one entry this is very very important for your examination because this can come in the prelims examination this can come in the mains examination and what is this concept of one data one entry that the nia should be interested with all task of maintaining national terror database like the enforcement directorate does for financial crimes the narcotics control bureau does for narco crimes so basically three basic authorities need to be there the ed does it for the financial crimes the narcotics control bureau does it for narco terrorism and narco crimes so nia should be given this task to keep the national terror database together and what the home minister has actually pointed out is that we need to utilize the nad grid or what we call as a national intelligence grid where 11 agencies come together to create this nia database for example what is the nad grid so nad grid can bring different organizations and different databases together for example uid vehicle re registration and driving license mobile call details bank account details stock market train reservation passport and income tax under one grid which is called nad grid so in itself it is centralization of authority centralization of data which has its own problems for sure however the point is that when it comes to terrorism we need to create a precedence in which the data is at least centralized because as of right now there is fragmented data for each state and because of doubling and because of these gaps terrorist organizations are funding and performing their activities within india itself so the topic is very straight forward and simple but it's very very important for you for two reasons first is that there's a proposed plan by 2024 this will happen which is that nia is going to have offices throughout india in each and every state second is that there's a urge for centralization of law and order which is equally important and the most important two words for you for the examination one data one entry the concept is that we need to create a centralized database how the ed has it how the narcotics control bureau has it nia should also have it in that regard but as i said as a downside there's also a chance for misuse of the nia and that is something which we need to be wary of democracy is always fragile and we need to protect it with the politicization of the cbi the nia needs to be a little bit more autonomous and transcend the basic politics of india as of right now the third topic deals with a very interesting discussion which is happening as of right now in our political sphere which is the concept of having lakshmi and ganesh on currency notes the concept of goddesses and gods on currency is something which technically is challenging certain sensibilities for example the concept of secularism however there are both pros and cons for it because of the way the concept of currency works and what the implications of god and goddesses are however for our discussion as a student of history as for gs paper 1 what becomes important is that has there been any precedents for 
the concept of god and goddesses on currency so a numismatical understanding can give us a picture of what has been the case historically and therefore the study of coins which is nothing but numismatics is important and it becomes relevant so you can now expect in the mains paper something related to numismatics and coins and currency because now currency is in the news again because of this recent controversy with regards to god and goddesses we don't have to take sides as upsc aspirants we will look at the sensibility of the government with regards to it it has its own pro and cons but the basic point is has there been precedence for god and goddesses on currency yes there has been and throughout the indian civilization in the ancient period with regards to the kushanas be it the vijayanagara empire with the guptas we have seen a lot of different forms of god and goddesses being represented but what this article is trying to point out is when can we go and trace the first usage of god and goddesses in the indian tradition of currency and in that regard the article is pointing out that india has a long tradition of coinage with images of god and goddesses but for the purpose of the examination this is very important for you though we have indo greek coins which are quite interesting and the first proper coinage in india the indo greek or the indo bactrian coins but the problem was that all of the coins had greek gods but when we talk about the kushana coins the kushana coins are the first time we see the usage of indian gods and goddesses so the kushanas which is at the post modern period in the larger story of ancient india maurya and gupta in between comes post modern period you have the shungas there after the indo greeks and indo bactrians the shakas and then the kushanas kushanas and satvanas are contemporaries so the kushanas were the first to use the image of goddess lakshmi in their coins along with ardrosho who is the iranic goddess of wealth so basically because kushanas had a central asian origin coming from central asia because of the chinese empire expanding who had also pushed the shakas into india basically they were coming from central asian sector so they were picking up on iranic goddesses and god also the iranian tradition and indian god and goddesses when they came into india so when it comes to goddess lakshmi itself for the purpose of the examination the kushanas gave us the first reference of representation of goddess lakshmi on coins and as the newspaper says that we have to go with this option and as it is indo greeks and indo bactrians are known for proper coinage but no indian gods specific reference the most explicit reference is in the kushana period so this is a very important point you need to remember for your art and culture aspect related to prelims and the mains exam the kushanas also depicted oesho as shiva and you have the moon deity miro and buddha in their coinage so the kushanas had a very wide plethora of coinage in that regard they are the foremost to introduce and circulate gold coins in india the vijayanagara empire also used hindu idols harihara too introduced coins that had brahma saraswati vishnu lakshmi and shiva parvati and this is again a very important series of coinage which we find in the medieval period and what is the most interesting aspect is that goddess lakshmi in what we call as the lakshmi series of coins of muhammad of gori or muhammad bin sam were also found in india after he defeated prithviraj chauhan in the battle of terrain in 1192 however very simple topic but very important first kushanas were the first to use the image goddess lakshmi explicitly on their coinage second there are also other mentions of even shiva miro and buddha on kushana coinages third which is that vijayanagara empire had the trilogies together so for the purpose of the examination please remember the basic facts so what have we done till this point we've understood first the concept of the disinformation law which was introduced in turkey a major and problematic precedence now introduced by turkey itself second thereafter we tried to understand the concept of centralization of law and order systems the nia and the nat grid and now we've done a very important concept related to art and culture which is with the recent controversy with regards to goddesses and gods on currency we need to know the larger historical story and the larger historical significance of this debate itself so first three topics very interesting very easy now let's move to the fourth topic which is related to schemes and their budgeting the basic point is that we don't have to go into the data which is given 
by this article but it is a concerning story that when it comes to schemes be the centrally sponsored scheme or the central sector schemes there is a change in the governmental approach with consolidation and over and above that there is also a new trend which we are seeing is that a lot of money is being withheld by the government of india before being disbursed so the point of this article is a little bit negative but we have to just take it out as a cautionary story so over the past 3 years over 50% of existing central government sponsored schemes have been discontinued subsumed revamped or rationalized into other schemes and the impact has been there on various ministries for example union ministry of women and child development there were just three schemes now out of the 19 schemes which were there i.e mission shakti mission vatsalya saksham anganwadi and poshan 2.0 mission shakti itself replaced 14 schemes which included beti bachao beti padhao scheme which is very very important which is that the old scheme beti bachao beti padhao scheme has been subdued within these four basic schemes from the union ministry of women and child development what is more important is that there's a similar trend in all ministries for example in ministry of animal husbandry and dairy two schemes remain out of the 12 which were introduced from schemes that exist there's also a challenge of what we call as fund cuts and disbursements and utilization of the funds as of june of 2022 1.2 lakh crore of the funds meant to be disbursed under central government sponsored scheme are with banks not disbursed the farming sector has also seen an impact of this as when we talk about fertilizers the subsidy has declined over the past few years from close to 1 lakh 27 thousand crores it has gone down to 80 thousand crores and thereafter also increased to 1 lakh crore so the basic point is it is hovering between the 1.27 lakh crores to the 1 lakh crore bracket however as we see in between the pandemic there was some revision however the larger allocation as of right now for 2022-23 is 1 lakh crore which is less than what was allocated in 2020-21 further when it comes to manrega 25 percent reduction in the budgetary allocation while the allocation in 21-22 was 98 thousand crores it has been reduced to 73 thousand crores in 2022-23 now for wildlife and habitat development in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, there is further reduction with regards to the budgetary allocation from 165 crores to 124 crores to 87 crores and basically the, the decline in the funds is very very progressive. Project Tiger itself has been halved to some amount from 323 crores to 194 crores. Now these crores don't matter to us, this basic data has of no purpose to us what is important is this article is a cautionary story which is that you can't have multiple schemes and if you have multiple schemes we need to manage it in a certain way that they don't become a liability on us itself we can call this process as a process of fiscal prudence and fiscal consolidation however these schemes were lifelines to a lot of people and vulnerable sections of the society be it children women or different classes of india they should not suffer because of fiscal prudence and fiscal consolidation and more than that these trends are alarming because basic schemes have been stopped and subsumed which is an indicator of the fact that the government was hastily introducing schemes and now is consolidating so this article you don't need to be negative about the government as a UPS assessment you never have to what you need to understand is there's a very fine line between too many schemes and very less allocation disbursement of funds is very important we previously also done something related to social audits where money has not been allocated to social audit authorities this is concerning and we need to remember it in the larger perspective of our polity and governance issues with this let's go to the last topic which is an encouraging one which comes out of gujarat which is that finally india will be producing the c295 aircraft in india itself and it will be a collaboration between an indian company and airbus so the manufacturing facility of c295 transport aircraft has been set up at vadodara in gujarat by the tata advanced systems limited and it will be a partnership with the european aviation major airbus of the 56 C-295s which have been procured by India, 40 will be built at this facility 
and this will replace the old avro aircrafts which have been used by the indian air force quite a lot so the plane which they are replacing is avro which is the old transport aircraft which they have however the new c295 is much modern has a bigger capacity and is much better suited for the if and more than that as airbus is going to produce it in india it is quite encouraging in that sense also so the c295 is an aircraft of 5 to 10 tons capacity used for tactical transport of up to 71 passengers or 50 para troops and it's a very important plane for logistical operations and that too it is very very important for logistical operations in places where heavier aircraft such as the globe master can't go so therefore these are used to transport basic necessities and goods into the remote areas and inaccessible areas for the iaf it can operate from short or unprepared air strips also which is equally interesting and important that you don't need a proper airport and air strip in that regard this is the start of an entire ecosystem for aviation sector because the regional maintenance repair and overall hub will also be established in india itself and the first 16 will be coming to india in september 2023 which is under the concept of fly away however the next set which is the made in india aircraft is expected to be produced by september 2026 and by 2031 we'll be able to produce eight aircrafts per year so before i move on to the main questions what have we covered today first we understood a very concerning story out of turkey a precedent for the world which is disinformation law which can in turn lead to stifling of freedom of speech in turkey thereafter we tried to understand the concept of a centralized nia based server using the nad grid terror data should be in one place third topic was equally interesting which is numismatic history of the use of goddess lakshmi in the recent controversy kushana has been a very important moment in that regard thereafter we saw a concerning story coming out of schemes where we are seeing a reduction in schemes a consolidation in schemes and the money being disbursed is being delayed and there is a shrinkage in the budgetary allocation however it is a part of fiscal consolidation and fiscal prudence so it should not be seen in fully negative light and the last topic is an encouraging story coming out of gujarat which is that c295 aircraft will be produced in india and we will have a capacity by 2031 by the next decade to produce eight aircrafts per year in india itself which is a game changer for our defense technology and defense machinery with this let's look at the main question Turkey's disinformation law has created a dangerous precedent for free speech and dissent in the world elucidate this is about the concerning aspect a uniform law and order system is the need of the hour with reference to terrorism critically analyze you need to talk about both the positive and the negative with this i would like to end the session thank you so much for your patience i will see you in the next video take care bye bye